Today's presentation is called um, International Scholars in Rhode Island, Immigration and the Shaping of Life. So we have two guests today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Alex Holt, who um, has served as Executive Director of International House since August of 2019. He draws upon his more than 15 years of nonprofit management, community building, and education experience to oversee International House, fostering a dynamic place for cross-cultural activity in Rhode Island. Um, and also with us today, we have Andrea Flores, who is a um, Barton Gregorian Assistant Professor of Education at Brown University. Um, she is a cultural anthropologist who specializes in anthropology of education. Her research interests primarily center on how education shapes immigrant and immigrant descendants since her self transitions to adulthood and social belonging in the United States. And I believe she's the author of two books. So um, welcome, Andrea and Alex. Hello, oh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen with the presentation for today. Um, just go back. So, um, uh, as, as mentioned, the, the title of the talk is a kind of about immigration and the shaping uh, uh, of a life, thinking about how international scholars who find their ways to Rhode Island uh, come to call Rhode Island home or, or how they come to think about their time here. And so in today's talk, I'm going to be providing the, uh, the academic context for what scholars have looked at in terms of um, uh, what are the, the pushes and pulls of uh, scholars migration uh, to the United States and how they make their kind of decisions about staying or not. And a little context about the history of uh, international scholars coming to the United States and what um, supports opportunities and barriers they face when here. And Alex will be providing uh, more of the kind of uh, color commentary to on, on a football Sunday about um, how folks come to uh, um, it, have their experiences of living, learning, and teaching in the United States. And this picture here is of Barack Obama Sr., who was an international scholar, who came as part of the African airlift in the 1960s, funded by uh, the Kennedy uh, Foundation. We'll end the talk with some concluding thoughts about Again, the kind of barriers and bridges to belonging and settlement that scholars face and how you might get involved with International House if you so choose. Alex, do you want to say a little more about yourself or just say hello? <laughs> yeah, that's great, Andrew. I think very well said. And I'll, I'll be providing some maybe anecdotes and color commentary, as you mentioned, uh, well said as we go through. And uh, a little bit of background about how I come to this. My research is primarily focused on questions of college access with immigrant and immigrant descendant youth uh, from Latin America in the US South. Um, but I'm starting a new research project about how scientists who have trained in the United States for their postgraduate and postdoctoral uh, studies make the decision uh, at the end of their training to stay in the United States go home or migrate to a third country. And that's uh, my new project uh, and hopefully someday new book. So uh, a brief history of when and where scholars kind of started coming to the United States, we can trace it back to, in some ways, very much the, the early days of the United States. If we think about Alexis uh, de Tocqueville, uh, who, who wrote um, this early tome about American life uh, and came in the, uh, uh, mid 18, uh, 19th century, but the, the one of the kind of first scholars to come was uh, uh, Young Wing in 1854, um, I'm sorry, in 1872, he started the Chinese educational mission. Young Wing was the first Chinese graduate of Yale University and he went on to become a uh, diplomat and spearheaded this um, educational mission, which was the idea to bring young 
uh, Chinese men as students to the United States to kind of aid in the uh, reforming efforts of the Chinese di dynasty at the time. They brought 100 and he brought 120 uh, students primarily to the Northeast. So this gets to that kind of Rhode Island in the world uh, or New England in the world. There were 18 in at MIT in particular, which made it the second uh, largest destination with Yale being first. Um, and this is on the on as looking at my screen on the left hand side. Uh, Kwon Young Chung was one of those young men who was brought um, here. There was very slow growth, as you might imagine, uh, during the 19th to early 20th century. And just to give you a sense here, uh, most Americans at this time don't have a high school diploma, about 16% do, and uh, only 3.3% of the US has a college degree at this point. So this is a very elite story at this moment. We could even, uh, for those of you who might be Hamilton fans there going further back, uh, Alexander Hamilton, one of the reasons why he came from Nevis, uh, which of course then was part of the Ameri the British Empire in the US, in the, excuse me, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you could point to him as one of the first international students who came to a uh, King's College, now Columbia. But really it's kind of starts growing early 20th century, about 8,000. Um, things really start to pick up, as you might imagine, in the mid 20th century, um, primarily because of World War II. There were um, the Jewish refugee scholars at the time, the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, did some sponsorship and, and they actually if you if you go to their website, they have a very interesting set of uh, collections about uh, the different scholars that they brought with them or brought over. But this was a pretty limited effort where they um, were trying to bring, bring best and brightest and not kind of uh, every scholar in Europe. Um, there was also the Emergency Committee and Aid of Displaced Foreign Scholars, which was an effort on behalf, uh, excuse me, run by academics in the United States to bring um, scholars in. And so folks like Hannah Arendt um, down there lounging on the bottom picture, uh, the philosopher uh, came. And also this on the side here is uh, the 1922 Nobel Prize winner in um, uh, excuse me, in, in uh, medicine, uh, was brought by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, Post-war, we have Operation Paperclip, which is kind of the uh, opposite of the Jewish Refugee Scholars Program. Paperclip brought Werner von Braun, who you see here with the rockets. The idea was to bring Nazi scientists or scientists employed by the Nazi uh, uh, regime, brought about, about 1,500 scientists to the U.S. to kind of aid in the space race. 1947, we have the, the Fulbright program to kind of bring this idea of scholarly exchange and building post-world uh, war uh, scholarly community. And again, as I mentioned, the African airlift in the 60s. And there's a, a chubby Barack Obama there with his father. Um, and that brought, uh, I think, as I mentioned, about 250 scholars from East Africa. And this Again, I think both in uh, Paperclip, Fulbright, African Airlift, there's this idea of, of the Cold War is kind of undergirding this, right, to make this a destination for uh, African scholars to kind of stem the tide of, of communism taking uh, root there, and the idea of the Fulbright program as well to kind of rebuild post-war Europe. In the late 20th century, um, with the rise of kind of oil money, uh, from OPEC producing countries, we see folks from Iran and the oil producing uh, countries coming for scientific training again to kind of build infrastructure in their own uh, nations of origin, the idea of going back. And in more recent years, we've seen more competition from Canada and the UK as cheaper options and potentially less nativist options than the United States. Oops. And now in the early 20th century, we've seen a dip here. You can kind of see actually on this graph, partly from COVID, right, uh, that uh, folks weren't coming. But there were other dips as well. Post 9-11, there were increased restrictions on scholars and students coming. The global financial crisis saw a lot of people flocking to graduate school worldwide. And so we see a little bump then. But we also see a dip uh, during the, the Trump administration, and there were some policy reasons for that that I will get to later. 
And so here you can see from, from 2000 to, to uh, just a couple years ago, right? You can see the big plummet with the pandemic, obviously. Um, but the numbers have been on the rise. Uh, and if this was a much larger graph, you'd see it was a, a very large, uh, excuse me, a much longer graph, you'd see it was a, a largely a, a trajectory of, of steady incline over time. So when we think about who today's international students and scholars are, and I'm kind of talking about them uh, together, but if we think about students as folks maybe coming for um, uh, undergrad through graduate training and scholars maybe coming from postdocs or to work as um, professional um, researchers. There's now about uh, 950,000 students in the US currently and the who are um, non uh, non U.S. Uh, students, and they and the U.S. population is about 331 million. So one of those million is uh, about the the student population. The majority of them are studying STEM subjects, and most are graduate students. So most are coming for PhDs or masters. And you can see here, uh, going back to the days of uh, Young Wing, uh, China is the leader in sending students abroad. Uh, okay. Oops. And again, here's just something of the kind of fields of study. You can see that STEM is quite high, particularly uh, math, computer science, and engineering. Um, but the physical sciences and uh, health professions uh, together would make up a pretty substantial portion. And in fact, um, there's a scholar at MIT who talks about the fact that uh, scientific labs are among the most diverse workplaces in the United States that have um, folks from all over the world. And when we look at today's international scholars, this kind of postdoctoral uh, group, we see it's a, a far smaller amount of people, 85,000, um, and but the vast majority of them are in STEM and in research positions, so working in labs, not necessarily working in industry. Harvard is the uh, largest uh, host of international scholars uh, within the uh, United States. And actually, if you look at kind of the top 10 uh, serving institutions, uh, four, I think, are, are in the Northeast. All right. And when we look at the international scholars, right, it's a similar trend with physical and life sciences and health professions, the STEM fields uh, being uh, the top. And this agricultural one may also kind of get between kind of biology and and uh, uh, food production. When we think a little closer to home, uh, I kind of looked at the the stats for two of the the big. Uh, Educational leaders here in Rhode Island, University of Rhode Island, it's about 2.6% of the student population. And again, representing those broader trends, mostly in science, mostly Chinese, and similarly at Brown, where they are a larger population um, in terms of percentage and obviously just in terms of hard numbers. But these are also um, here at, at uh, at Brown, you see that the engineering is is popular, but true to the Brown education model, it's uh, also a lot of liberal arts students. Oh, I think. Hold on, we seem to be going. There we go. Okay, so when we look at the scholar population at Brown, postdoctoral researchers, it's uh, smaller, and that also includes faculty, and that's a picture of the. Uh, International Center at Brown. Okay, so the kind of uh, for scholars and students who are coming uh, to study abroad, what we uh, we think about the role of the university as kind of the first uh, area of footing, right? It's uh, where there are immigration coordinating officials uh, employed by the university to make sure that students stay or scholars stay in their status. There are language centers um, and the research here is a little mixed that these centers um, can reinforce uh, stereotypes about the language proficiency of of international scholars and um, that rather than focus on uh, having many languages as an asset that it kind of focuses on English dominance. Um, and in my research I've had uh, scientists talk to me about feeling like if they did not master English, it would be a real um, 
limitation for them, right? Um, and that people wouldn't want to interact with them or employ them outside of the university. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about uh, some of that in questions. Uh, there's also been a, a growing recognition within university supports for the distinct needs of these learners and scholars that they may face some cultural barriers um, and also the challenge of making home from uh, from the great distance of where they might be from. Alex, I'll turn it over to you because International House was actually one of these first types of supports for these scholars making a life abroad. Thanks, Andrea. Um, yeah, I, I think we're uh, we're kind of continuing to zoom in the aperture here and get uh, from the broad macro picture that uh, you've done a wonderful job of providing to like the hyper local. Um, and so I'll speak a little bit uh, just about International House, which was founded in 1963 as an independent nonprofit organization. Uh, initially, I would say um, my understanding of the history. Um, it really started out of uh, really relationship was the, the key thing. And and um, a couple, Billy and Gil Mason um, founded International House with sports supports of international students at the time. And uh, Billy Mason was writing uh, the story I've been told at least was she was writing a book and was looking for an illustrator and uh, contacted Brown and RISD and was uh, connected with a, an illustrator from Japan uh, who was at RISD. And, they met and she invited him into her home and the students started crying. Uh, and it was during the holiday time and all of the students were away seeing family. And um, and she thought she had done something wrong initially. And then in the conversation, uh, the student expressed that it was the first time they'd been invited into someone's house since they've been in Rhode Island. And uh, so that was sort of the genesis of um, this idea of of uh, the scholars and people being here from other countries and places and sort of the isolation that can exist. And so that was the genesis of starting International House. Uh, I moved, in, uh, it was 1963, it moved to H. Simpson Avenue, uh, which is uh, the home now of International House in a historic 900, 9,000 square foot building. And there's a uh, and sort of a multi-purpose community center at this point uh, in current day. Uh, six international students live on the second and third floor and uh, that's their residence, uh, usually graduate students or postdoc scholars. And then on the first floor, we have uh, a multi-purpose, uh, uh, multicultural community center uh, where we do a series of different events that I'll speak about in a moment. And I think at the core, as I was thinking about this talk, um, like really what International House is addressing is isolation and you know issues connected to acculturation. And I'll speak about that a little bit more in a moment. Uh, so uh, one of the interesting, unique things is that really the primary constituency for International House is temporary international visitors. Um, and you know, it, it, if, we, if you think about your own experience being somewhere, uh, you know, if we're somewhere for a month or two months, maybe we feel like, you know, we're just there in this short time and we don't even settle. And if we've moved somewhere and it's a new place and we feel like we're gonna be living there, we probably put down roots and, and settle in a certain way. And so a lot of the temporary international visitors you're here for one to three years, you're sort of in this in-between space of you're in a place, you put down roots, but there's always this sense of um, sort of uh, a temporary nature of things. And and um, so more specifically, the, the people that tend to come to International House, the students uh, get a lot of support through the universities, so the undergrad and graduate students, but really um, the groups that International House tends to, to uh, most serve now are international uh, spouses, family members of scholars that come here um, who are particularly isolated. And also a lot of times the postdoctoral scholars, um, there's a number of people who come and they're, they're here studying with one professor, they're in one lab. And um, I've heard many stories, uh, and of course the pandemic amplified this, where people have been here for over a year and maybe haven't met a single person outside of their um, the area of study. And so that's one, that's really what we're 
addressing is the um, kind of the isolation and issues around acculturation. Uh, we also have sort of a secondary audience group, which is local residents of Rhode Island who are interested in arts and cultural events. And so we have dinners and concerts and lectures, and um, we have some programming, um, uh, a friendship program, and we do a Thanksgiving home hosting. We try to connect local residents uh, who are open to the idea of uh, bringing in an international scholar to their Thanksgiving meal with their family, and um, and, inter and international scholars will attend and and have just a, a, a local experience. Um, and I think maybe just re coming back to this idea again is uh, the things that we're thinking about at International House is. Um, really it started out of this power of what a relationship can do and in thinking about this talk I was also thinking how and I think my guess is that everyone here could imagine a, a person or a few people that you've met that have changed the arc of your life you know and and um and and thinking about the people who are here for this sh short temporary period of time and you could have one experience of being here and meet nobody, you know, and what a difference it makes when you meet a few people and, and um, the stories I hear from that. And so the, the relationships that develop with um, this idea of bringing the spirit of American, and, um, well, hopefully that's still the value of inclusivity and, you know, democracy and, and, and the spirit of welcoming, uh, welcoming the stranger, you know, welcoming other people from all other places and, and, I, and when that's done, the power of that then spreads back to uh, people's home countries when they go home and they really have a unique experience being here. Um, and and I, I, my personal belief is, is, is that I think that really can add to someone's uh, academic or you know, career um, arc uh, and be extremely supportive. Uh, and there is a lot of pressure under, and I think we'll get to that next with the, the sort of constraints of the visa system and, and the pressures that puts on somebody's life. So, yeah, so as Alex just was uh, discussing that the, when we think about immigration, obviously there's a whole host of policy issues and questions about comprehensive immigration reform and where do scholars, particularly those who are going to be here on a more temporary basis, where do they fit in kind of the immigration policy landscape? I'm not going to uh, go over each of these, the idiosyncrasies of each of these acts uh, for you. I'm happy to talk more about them specifically in, in questions, but early on in kind of immigration policy in the US, there was very little governing immigration until the late 19th century. Primarily laws were about naturalization, and then it became kind of about limiting the amount of people who could come. Uh, and often that was along kind of ethno-racial lines. So the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, right, bar barred folks from China coming to the United States. However, there was a provision for the students, right, um, is to, to come. And that was the same through the quota acts of the 1920s, that students were largely seen as separate, a separate category, because the idea was that they were coming and then quickly leaving. Um, visas for students get get um, codified in, in the early 1950s. Um, and um, we see in 1965 is kind of the landmark law for immigration, uh, immigration in the United States that shifted from a quota based system that was based that uh, primarily um, benefited folks from Northern Europe. Um, 1965 kind of changes the shape of American immigration away from Europe to allowing folks from Africa, Asia, and Latin America to enter the United States. Um, 86 is kind of uh, the big, big moment of uh, Reagan's amnesty in the United States for folks who are undocumented. But, um, and of course, the, that's usually when we think about uh, the major immigrant populations in the United States as folks who are coming for work. But in 86, we also uh, see the creation of, we'll talk about this particular type of visa, the H-2B visas. Limitations come back on again, kind of following the Patriot Act post 9-11 to kind of, uh, and that's particularly because one of the, the, the um, 
folks involved in 9-11 had was on an overstayed student visa. So there were increased um, uh, controls put on since then. And, and the most recently, right, we had things in the pandemic to kind of allow folks to be stay in the United States and not travel as students um, and changing, you know, the requirements to be in person or not. So that, uh, but that uh, we're still kind of navigating those waters of how in-person learning in the time of a pandemic, how that affects uh, immigration status. So the process of getting to school for a student and what that looks like as an international student is is quite complex. This is a nut. So for those of you who've had a loved one go through college admissions recently, you know that that's a very stressful process. Putting on that, that um, applying from abroad and getting in uh, to a school that complies with with US policy, you then have to start to navigate the kind of uh, many layers of Im immigration bureaucracy. So you have to pay an additional fee and you fill out a form, you fill out another form, you have to go to the embassy and consulate to have an interview, um, and you need to kind of schedule this, you know, depending on the country you're in, uh, months in advance. Sometimes it's as easy as days in advance. Usually you do that at the embassy within your nation of origin or the consulate within your nation of origin, but if the consulate doesn't exist in your country or there's no embassy in your country, you can go to a third, you have to then travel to a third country that does have um, an embassy or consulate. And so um, there's a lot of waiting in this process. Um, and uh, once students get to um, their, their um, uh, university, they have to check in at the university with what's called coordinating officials. And these are folks who um, there's this system called SEVIS that was implemented post 9-11 that uh, make sure that people are staying in status and uh, checks to make sure they're there, that they came in on the right visa, um, because sometimes students could have maybe a tourist visa, right? And so when they come in to go to school, they have to make sure that, that when they go through customs that they have the right visa to show uh, someone. And this seems like it would just be kind of a straightforward process, but in the inter preliminary interviews that I've done with some um, students uh, or former students who are now employed as scientists or postdoctoral researchers or within industry have talked about being held up at airports for folks not believing that they were students that this might not be a real visa trying to call the coordinating official to say yes so and so is a student here being detained for hours uh coming back um and that it can be or the opposite oh i accidentally gave them the wrong form i gave them my travel visa from when i was traveling and now i'm in the wrong status so uh, something that got me interested in this project was a story that my dad told me, who is himself came here on a J visa um, to study medicine, and that he was in a conference room waiting for a presentation on some sort of new uh, clinical application. There was a Peruvian doctor, a Chinese doctor, my father's from Guatemala, a doctor from Canada, and one from the UK. And the Peruvian doctor got up to give his presentation and said, well, we're all here as the triumph of the J visa. And all the doctors laughed because they all had come on what is uh, a visa that is supposed to be time limited and not lead towards uh, mig uh, migration. But here they all were years later working in the hospital uh, together. And many of them, like my father, had married American women and created a life that they didn't intend to have when they came uh, purely for academic purposes, but perhaps found love on the floor of a hospital, right? So the complex world of visas that you have, you have the F1 visa, which is for an academic student. They're usually time bound. Um, they are time bound, excuse me. Um, that doesn't mean that they can't be um, extended. So if a student needs extra time on their degree, they can file for an extension. Students can also bring dependents and spouses with them. That would be an F2 visa. You So these are academic students are on the F1 visa. Vocational students who may be coming for other types of training come on an M visa. Exchange visitors like those doctors who came for perhaps residency or a short, 
short-term uh, fellowship, uh, our exchange, right? And part of the terms of the J are that you go back, right? That you, that the idea is I don't intend to stay here. Um, sometimes people have to change that, right? Because um, as our title suggests, life happens, right? And you uh, find out that there's a job opportunity or you meet someone, right? H-1B visas, those visas that were created in 1986, there are kind of two types of those. Uh, well, there's H-2B, excuse me. <laughs> there are two types of these visas. There's agricultural workers, and then there's H-1B that um, we often see that in the news, talking about computer programmers. You know, we often see Bill Gates talking about that, saying that they need more H-1B workers to kind of stay on top of uh, computer science innovation, right? Those, and each one of these categories, as you see, has a, a, an additional category for folks to bring families and spout, uh, bring their dependent children and spouses. But for those dependent children and spouses, depending on the, the visas they're on, they may or may not be able to work. And the ability to work or not really affects their ability to integrate into, as Alex is mentioning, right, kind of broader um, community groups to get outside of the home, to get into the kind of world of the new place where they're living. So I'll let Alex kind of talk about the experiences he's seen with as people navigate the bureaucracy of immigration. Yeah, and, and just providing a little color and a few examples on this, which I, I found really kind of interesting. Um, with and as Andrea is saying, <clears throat> this, <clears throat> the ability to work or not, or engage in school on the spouse visa specifically um, is, is so determinant. And I I don't know the exact source of this, but I, I went to a talk once and the presenter said that the number one reason why H-1B visas don't work out is because of the dissatisfaction of the spouse or family members. and um, and this idea of you know how impactful it is to to be in, in another place i mean I, I moved from new york to rhode island three years ago and, and you know just before the pandemic actually and you know you you, I, you gotta adjust to meet new people and it takes a little time and never mind if it's a language barrier and a cultural barrier and you go to the supermarket and none of your foods are there and and ad infinitum um so and the sort of um, the wonderful stories are when these relationships get formed. So, for example, um, you know, someone a spouse, an uh, H-1B worker, uh, and th their family found International House, and and then uh, the picture there of uh, Bob and, and Zita on the bottom left. Uh, he actually went to the Czech Republic to visit them there, and and now they have Rhode Island as this place that they come to, and and this this sort of formation of this uh, connection and, and the the, the topic of the talk from Rhode Island to the world, there becomes this connection through the relationship that really lasts over time. Um, and similarly, uh, this is also a spouse um, of a J-1 visa holder in the top right and with an H-1B worker and, and they met at an international house and promised to meet again in Japan. And, and so they uh, traveled to Japan to, to meet again and, and the ripples of, of relationships. Um, and you know, the other thing I'd like to maybe just comment on is that it's interesting thinking about constraints and what those do. Like sometimes the constraint creatively can help because <laughs> the endless possibilities can be too many possibilities, but the constraint can also create so much pressure. Um, and I think a lot of the, the, the J1, particularly those are more my experience, these postdoc workers who are coming really with this intention of, uh, maybe forwarding their career for a new opportunity back home or an opportunity here in the U.S. And um, in conversations with them, that's really a topic that comes up, like the the pressure that's created out of the time constraint of the visa and how much that dictates people's choices. All right, so kind of from the, the literature that's on international students and scholars, and again, some of my preliminary research, particularly in the life sciences and STEM fields more broadly, um, there's a perception of having to study or work 
work in the United States, as Alex mentioned, for that kind of field-based advancement back at home, right? So it's one German scientist I spoke to had done an exchange program as a master's student, and he said, you know, my my undergraduate mentor um, or one of my one of his research mentors had said, you know, you know go to the US, that'll get you good training, and then that'll give you opportunities to go to, to other places, right? And so there's this idea that this is a, a needed stepping stone. It's not necessarily something that people take as, this is gonna be my life now, I'm a scientist in the United States, but uh, the decision to unfold, to stay unfolds over time, right? And that some of it is uh, folks, w something that was common in the, with some of the people I spoke with is that they kind of were surprised that they ended up in the United States, that they had no intention of it, but that uh, the more they kind of went through the steps of American academics and many of uh, people kind of talk about the step um, of folks coming for undergrad, right, is kind of this initial exposure, they decide to stay for graduate school, and that these schooling things are kind of just a as they launch you into young adulthood, you just find your adulthood now has been based in this other country. So when we think about uh, a lot of the literature and kind of the student life, uh, more, more um, practical literature talks about what are kind of the motivating experiences that would make someone have a positive um, experience in school to make them want to stay and what also forces people out. And so as Alex has mentioned, um, on the social aspect, to, to work my way uh, backwards here, that uh, international students uh, can be, are often separate from the receiving community. They can be kind of herded into an international enclave, either by nation of origin, and that can be both sides, right? That can be, you're worried about your English, so you hang out with folks who speak your language, right? Because it's more comfortable. Um, something that uh, some of the students mentioned to me, or former students mentioned to me, is I just hung out with all international people because we were in a small college in Maine. And I mean, I was the only one from my country, but this person was from Hong Kong and, you know, they also understood what it was like to be foreign here. Um, the But sometimes the the integration can come in unusual ways, right? So one uh, young man I spoke with was really interested in theater. He was getting a degree in uh, virology and he joined a theater group and kind of got engaged in that on the side. And that's how he met a lot of um, non-international students, right? And so sometimes if students are able to pursue their interests outside, and that could be through something like International House, they can create that sense of community outside of the lab because the lab or the department can be a supportive place, but can also be a, a harmful one. Um, I've heard some, some scary tales of uh, students uh, and postdoctoral um, researchers being told by their primary investigator that they won't support them going on a visa if they don't work weekends or uh, taking credit for researchers' work, right? Um, so that you can kind of be beholden and, and kind of held ransom, right, by your department. Or um, I also heard on the flip side, very many positive stories of um, PIs and advisors helping that student connect to uh, resources on campus and also um, trying to build up students' sense of confidence in English or in the American academic system. And Alex? Um, I think we can keep moving to the next slide, Andrew. I think this is just a re repeat of the mm -hmm. sentiment that I was expressing earlier with this idea of how a kind of a relationship can mm -hmm. shift someone's trajectory. Yeah, and so when we look at who decides to stay in the United States or not, it's usually, again, unsurprising because it is at this precipice of kind of what uh, scholars call emerging adulthood, right? When you're kind of starting to gain some of those markers of what makes a, an adult in contemporary society. So folks who are 30 or under, when they begin their graduate work in the U.S., tend to stay because they start to build some of those markers of adulthood, maybe finding a partner, having a child. Um, and that may affect where they, whether or not they're going to go back to another um, another nation or return home. 
if if students have been in a in a institution that has uh, is considered a, a major research institution, they will stay. Mostly scientists will stay, and if they um, stay in a non-academic job, so if the first job that folks get after training is something like management consulting or finance, they're also more likely to stay in the United States versus if they have, again, those folks who are talking about, we have to study in the United States to get a better job back home, right? If you're on that academic path, um, you may not decide to stay. And again, as I, as Alex and I have mentioned, right, if you find a spouse or you have a child, those decisions can also, those life choices can also impact um, folks' migratory plans. And I mention that because what we see in the popular coverage of these type of migrants or um, temporary visitors, right, is that th these are the type of people we want in the US, right, that they're here to provide their, uh, their expertise, their labor, and we think of them really as just kind of traveling experts, but we shouldn't forget that these are people that have um, emotional lives, connections to others, and that too can affect um, how they how and where, right, they decide to be. So just as conclu concluding thoughts um, here is, I'll just say that um, we can see that there, there's complicated bureaucracies of acad academia and immigration that are impacting how people are kind of navigating the decisions they're making. One person was telling me that, you know, he decided he didn't want to be in academic science anymore, but he, you know, he needed somebody to sponsor his visa. And while he had a passion for the arts and literature, that wasn't going to sponsor his visa. So we went into management consulting because they would, right? So that shaped his, his professional trajectory away from something that he was passionate about and the thing he trained for to something that would give him a foothold of, of legal status in the United States. Um, we can see that their experiences can be of isolation and integration. And as Alex mentioned with those lovely photos of folks connecting back across nations, right? Those individual connections also map onto broader socio-political dynamics as bonds of friendship are formed across nations. Decisions to stay can be both inevitable and unexpected, right? So someone, so when I was talking to people about decisions they had made 10 years ago to go to the United States, they would laugh and say, well, of course I should have realized I was going to end up staying. There's one person in my country that studies this. He still has that job, right? There was no job for me there. And there are more jobs for me here, right? Um, and I think I'll stop there and Alex can give a little uh, more about International House and ways to get involved with perhaps being those types of connections for others. Yeah, great, I'll just do a, a real real quick overview that everything's on our, our website. Um, we do send out a newsletter once or twice a month. So we don't, we don't do a daily email. We won't over flood you there. Um, but you can sign up for that on our on our website. And um, there's a different volunteer opportunities, but there's many people who volunteer to tutor or teach English classes or volunteer in different ways. Uh, and then uh, we have a bunch of cultural uh, uh, events. Uh, the two that are upcoming is there's a Robert Burns um, kind of Scottish dinner and poetry night uh, Friday, January 27th. Uh, and so that's a ticketed event, uh, $35 for members and $50 for, uh, if you're not a member membership at international house is $40 a year. So, um, that's an upcoming event. And then we also are hosting a now ruse event with the Rhode Island Iranian American uh, association in March, the beginning of the spring, uh, spring festival in Iran and different other countries in that part of the world. They're major holiday uh so we host that at the international house on march 18th um and so if you have any questions you can check out our website and feel free to reach out to me all right and here's our contact information and we're happy to take any questions uh you have thanks for for listening on your on your sunday afternoon thank you so much this was very interesting um you know, touches me very much to hear. Um, I, I am, I came to this country, um, you know, 
1983. It's been a while on a uh, resident alien uh, visa, green cards, and uh, we used to call. And um, I think that, um, you know, when I recall my experience of, um, you know, I was a transfer student, um, I was an undergrad, so I had to take some classes that were, you know, requirement classes, like your English literature and history. And I remember, you know, walking out of class, like I would get in my car and cry because I just would, mm -hmm. you know, I would sit through an entire class and not understanding a word. <laughs> <laughs> and I was very lucky to have the support system at home. You know, I had a husband that was, you know, he would do homework with me. And so I think that to come alone, like the students that um, we're talking about here, uh, it's wonderful that the International House has the programs, you know, the tutors and, um, you know, the, the events that those students can can take advantage of. It's, it's wonderful. Now, um, Alex, do you also, for um are there like um con conversation like conversation um english classes are there any like more formal classes that the students can take yeah yep exactly we have a uh, conversational english classes that a lot of uh spouses and um and then some scholars who are here just on their own will and also other members of the community it's not just um scholars and students but we have we have those during the week yeah yeah. Now, Andrea, with um, the students who come, you know, especially the PhD students and, you know, are they, do, do you find most of them are fluent in English? So, yeah, for, for, um, the, they'll have to take a TOEFL exam for, mm -hmm. for school, right? To, this is the English as a foreign language exam and, and pass that. Yeah. Um, but what, folks told me um, was was that they may have kind of the academic language, but that the things like making small talk and conversation and things that aren't, you know, out of in their field, right? Like they can talk science, but, you know, wanting to talk about sports or or the arts, like they didn't always have that um, set of skills or slang or things like that to kind of mm -hmm. communicate in daily life could be challenging. Or one person was telling me that he didn't care about sports at all, but it seemed like that was all anyone ever talked about. So he better learn how to talk about that. Right. Um, and so one thing in kind of the language stuff as well is um, there was an article that came out recently that was talking about many folks have to pass kind of as a prerequisite for their teaching they sometimes depending on the university have to pass kind of a teaching instruction in the language in english right mm -hmm. and that that can kind of in some ways reproduce biases that the only good english is unaccented english right and that that can be colored by people's biases listening to say well, we could understand them, but that's not actually how you pronounce that, right? And so that it can re reinforce notions about what's good English and what's bad English. Um, it's a long-winded answer, Anne, but... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Other folks? Yeah, any questions? Can I ask a quick question? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. there any um, thought about uh, showing uh, international students are museums and libraries and theater and that kind of things just so they can know some of the things that go on here other than what's at brown yeah um i think um for for sure i mean for many in our uh it's sometimes about who they can get connected to right so brown is if you're a brown student that's your first point of call but right. i know that the the international center there the the man who runs it tr does try to connect students to broader stuff so that they know that there are other things you can go to off college hill right and like off of um but that really depends on the work of places like international house or the individual universities to to kind of have that outreach to international students um i don't know if it's a coordinated it's not a coordinated effort i'll say that yeah and we've definitely organized a bunch of trips we try to do that to organized trips to different cultural uh sites in Rhode Island because there's so much to experience here and so the uh, trip to the RISD Museum or the Tomaquac Museum or um I'm trying to think a number of other places that small groups have, have organized with local volunteers mm -hmm. who how about the Museum of Work and Culture that's an outstanding one 
<laughs> yeah, that would be great. I'd love to organize a trip there. Anytime. Anytime. Do that. Yeah. We have and and some of our English classes they re, and and I mean the wonderful thing about this group of international um, scholars and students is it's a highly educated group and very curious group. So people love digging into local customs and holidays and all the so it would be a great trip to organize. And I will say the beaches are a draw. So. <laughs> <laughs> for today. Thank you so much, Andrea and Alex.